I have had five space shuttle flights. My last flight was one of the assembly flights of the International Space Station. Right. Okay. And what was your job? What's your job? Was your job as an astronaut? On each of my shuttle flights, because each of those flights had a very specific set of goals, a very specific mission, then we trained to do that particular thing. So on every shuttle flight, two people were trained to do a spacewalk. I was never one of those because I wasn't big enough, actually. Um, Two people were trained to work the robotic arm. So on three of my flights, I was trained to work the robotic arm. The pilot and commander are trained to do the launch and the landing. I was the flight engineer for three of my flights, so I trained to do that. And then we all had training to operate different experiments. So for every shuttle flight, there is somebody who's trained as the prime and then somebody as the backup. So there's right. never a single point where you you know, you know lose that person, you lose that experiment. Redundancy is a big thing. Huge thing. And what was your role on the IMAX film? I was hired by Tony Myers, who is the filmmaker for this movie, uh, to be a consultant for A Beautiful Planet. And I've known Tony for more than 30 years and participated in filming on many of the earlier space IMAX films. Uh, Had the opportunity, fortunate opportunity in my mind, to fly the IMAX camera on three of my missions. And then for missions where Tony was filming on other shuttle flights, I would support her uh, when they came to Houston during those flights. So I've retired from NASA, and when she got ready to make this movie, she asked me if I would like to consult, and I was said, I said, great, I would love to. So it turns out I was the local person in Houston, Tony's resident in Toronto, and our director of photography, James Nyhouse, is in Orlando, Florida, and Mission Control and the crew and all of the, the people that make decisions for, for space station things are in Houston, so I was the local Houston person. So any meeting that had to... Uh, be attended, any um, convincing of this is what we're going to do, procedures that had to be written so that the crew could understand them, real-time communication with the crew and feedback on on imagery that, that we'd gotten, that all came through me. Just tell us a little bit about the cameras because we're, we're used to thinking of IMAX cameras as these huge refrigerator-sized cameras. It's a bit hard to get that through a uh, portal in a space station. No, they actually would fit through the portal because we did that on Space Station. We filmed with the IMAX 3D film camera, and it is the size of a small portable fridge. Um, we had the advantage when we did those movies of flying the film, the, the magazines that held the film and the camera body and the lenses on the space shuttle, which could carry considerably more mass and volume than we can take on current spacecraft today. Um, And so we would fly the camera body and the shuttle in the inside and then rolls of film. Now a roll of film um, was probably the diameter of a little bit larger than a basketball maybe. You know, it's fairly large. uh, Weighed 10 pounds. um, And for the 3D camera was 90 seconds of film. And then you had to change that in a black bag in a giant magazine that that basically held two rolls of film, the one you were taking out, the one Mm. you were putting in. You had to thread it blindly like you... And this is in zero gravity. This is in zero gravity, yep. That was a a skill we had to learn real time. But the interesting thing about film was that because we only had maybe six or seven minutes on any one shuttle flight, every single scene that we shot was the one and only take. And we had to be not only the film crew, but the lighting people and the sound people. And the we had to rehearse it. We had to generate, construct a scene. Tony would give us sort of broad strokes of living in space. And it was up to us to decide how we wanted to actually film those 30 seconds. Right. So that was the great fun in that. When the time came to make this movie, the opportunity to fly film is gone. The disadvantage to film is that it is very quickly radiated in the space environment. And so for the two weeks that it lived on a space shuttle, um, it was fine. But leaving it on board a space station for four or five months would have radiated the film beyond being able to use it in a large IMAX screen. So we went to digital cameras. So the cameras that were used in the making of this film were Canon 
commercial, professional grade commercial cameras, and they weren't modified at all for our use. We used Canon cameras and Canon lenses and one Aeroflex lens. And that was for this film? For this film. So the first time this you're is, using digital IMAX cameras. This is the cameras. first. No, it's a digital camera used to make an IMAX film. It is not a digital IMAX camera. There's a difference. How well does this latest film show people what it is like to be in space and what the view is like from space? All of the IMAX movies, including this one, are really as close as you can come to the experience of being in space. And and any astronaut who's ever filmed in IMAX and then seen the movie has come back and said the same thing. So I'm not just trying to advertise it. It's actually true. Um, the screen is so large and the resolution is so good. Um, and, and the imagery shot is just so spectacular that it does give you as close to the experience as really being there. What, what of the emotion of the sight of entire continents, what emotions do you go through when you see that for the first time? Because you cover that in the movie, a new astronaut is looking down for the first time. What was it like for you when you first looked at Earth? Well, you don't see the Earth as a whole round globe because we're not that high. So you can see the, the imagery of the Earth that you see in this movie um, those were shot not with long lenses. So that's that's a little bit wider than what your eye sees, but you see about a third of the Earth. So can you imagine taking a very large globe and holding it out in front of you at arm's length and then sort of looking over the top of it? That's the angle that you see the Earth. So you see about a third, a quarter of a third of the Earth. Um, and I had seen all of the pictures from space and I'd spoken to people and seen videos of people that had been to space before me. But there's really nothing that prepares you for the fact that you are not on the planet. You know, there's a, it's a very unusual emotional feeling. How does that change you? Does it change you? I don't think it changed me. Um, it was just the coolest thing I'd ever seen for the most part. Were you happy that the film went to some trouble to show what life is actually like on the space station? But that there's a lot of work to be done, and that um, it can it can uh, it can take a toll, including muscle atrophy as well. Uh, I think every one of our IMAX space movies has done that intentionally. Done that. Um, you don't often get the opportunity to join a crew in space. Um, you know the NASA. NASA.gov has live streaming quite often, and, and you can do it, but you're watching that on your laptop, you know, or a small screen, and, and seeing it in an IMAX uh, theater in an IMAX screen puts you right next to the crew just about. And so that, that has always been a very big part of any film that Tony has made in space. Now, the film does show the beauty of Earth as seen from orbit. It also shows a damaged Earth, is the film intended to be a movie about the warnings of climate change? Is it meant to be an environmental film? It is meant to be an environmental film. It is meant, I think, to raise awareness for people to say that, um, and Samantha says it very well in the movie, just as we on board the space station have to take care of our crew, has to take care of our sh our ship because we're in a very hazardous envi environment, um, on the Earth, this spaceship Earth that we are flying through space, we have the same responsibility to take care of it. And, you know, Tony didn't write that script for her. That's just Samantha's words. And that's, that's a very true statement. I think the movie uh, makes a very strong case to show the footprint of humanity on the earth and, and that it's not always a, a gentle footprint. The, incro the the deserts that were once forests um, are very powerful shots, as are some of the political shots, if you like. North Korea. Now, the Korean shot is an incredible shot. Tell, yeah. us, tell us about that. There is one of the advantages that we had in shooting digital, a digital format on this movie, was that Digital has a much larger dynamic range than film does. And so for the first time ever in an IMAX space film, we, we were able to capture city lights at night 
and lightning and aurora and and all of the low light things that film just doesn't do well and so there are, there are beautiful pictures of parts of the earth at night italy just looking like it does on a map all lit up with lights in the nile um, which is incredible and a large chunk of the the eastern part of the united states that that without clouds i mean you know that's just beautiful stuff um, a lot of Europe it shows at night. And then it shows uh, Japan at night and fishing boats in the South China Sea. And then there's this wonderful picture of Korea, North and South Korea. And you see bright lights, probably some of the brightest lights on the planet in Seoul, South Korea. And then a line and then what looks like ocean, empty, nothing. And in fact, that whole area is has an equal number of people as South Korea, but it is North Korea, and only the capital has a few little lights on. And it's a very powerful image. It's uh, it's bizarre uh, to see that an entire civilization and an entire society can literally be living in darkness. Living in the dark, So yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's a very, very powerful shot.